teach at Mary Baldwin University in Stanton, Virginia. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you a little bit today about Cooper and abolition. Uh, quite a lot to get through in 10 to 15 minutes, so I'm going to switch over straight away uh, and show you my presentation, which I hope you enjoy. Thanks. After almost 200 years of relative neglect, Cooper's anti-slavery poems have received lots of attention in the past few years, reminding us how Cooper became the most widely quoted poet in abolitionist literature during the 19th century. He features prominently in these important anthologies by Marcus Wood and James Basker, for example. Today I want to talk about Cooper's most significant poems on slavery, almost all of which were known by Jane Austen. Then I want to expand upon his importance as an abolitionist poet and show how his influence extended into some slightly surprising areas. The 1782 volume of Cooper's poems we're celebrating today doesn't contain his most noted anti-slavery verse, but there is a substantial section in the long poem Charity which denounces slavery. The passage attacks merchants rich in cargoes of despair who drive a loathsome traffic gauge and span and buy the muscles and the bones of man. And it imagines trauma suffered by enslaved Africans separated from home and families and brutalised on the sugar plantations. At one point, the poem insists that a Briton knows, or if he knows it not, the scripture placed within his reach he ought, that souls have no discriminating hue, alike important in their maker's view. Uh, and this notion that slavery is incompatible with British virtue is a point that Cooper develops in various later poems. Far and away, Cooper's most influential anti-slavery poem is The Negro's Complaint. Critics have found allusions to this one within Emma and Mansfield Park, and it would have been difficult for Jane Austen and her family to have avoided reading it after its publication in 1788. In his 1808 history of the abolition movement, Thomas Clarkson, who Austen admired, recalls famously how the Negro's complaint was not only distributed in pamphlets in many thousand copies throughout the whole island, but was also set to music and widely sung as a ballad. It also circulated widely in America, uh, and the colour image you can see here is from a children's book of poems uh, about slavery, against slavery. For years afterwards, abolitionists printed this poem and others by Cooper in pamphlets, newspapers, magazines and collections of verse such as the anti-slavery album. After writing The Negro's Complaint, however, Cooper rather gave up writing about slavery, finding it simply too horrific. But he was forced to re-engage with the subject a few years later so to quash some horrible rumours that he was no longer an enemy but now a friend to the slave trade. In response, he wrote a sonnet to William Wilberforce and a bleak epigram on slaves' blood, and he published them in the Northampton Mercury in 1792. Gabrielle White, in her book on Austin and abolition, suggests that Austin has these poems in mind when, in Mansfield Park, she dates Sir Thomas's settling at Mansfield back to the early 1790s and locates Mansfield in Northamptonshire, a kind of tribute to the Northampton Mercury. While we're on the topic of Mansfield Park, it almost doesn't need repeating now that the title clearly alludes to Lord Mansfield, whose 1772 ruling in the Somerset case had effectively decided that slavery couldn't exist in England. This judgment is celebrated in a famous passage in Cooper's long poem, The Task, which we know from various passages in her novels and letters that Austen read and admired. Book two of the task, entitled The Time Peace, offers a survey of human sin and natural disasters and discusses the role that the church might play in improving the world. It opens with a passionate lament of man's inhumanity to man, of which slavery is the most appalling instance. I won't read the full passage here, but it's powerful stuff. And it's frequently quoted by other abolitionist writers across the Atlantic world, some key lines in particular. He finds his fellow guilty of a skin not coloured like his own. And I would not have a slave to till my ground, to carry me, to fan me while I sleep and tremble while I wake. Uh, and in the direct reference to the Mansfield ruling, uh, the observation indeed that slaves cannot breathe in England. If their lungs receive our air, that moment they are free. By the time Austen writes her novels then, Cooper's repeated attacks on slavery mean that his name alone becomes a signifier of abolitionist sentiment. And so Austen's repeated references to Cooper, uh, 
likely carried much more weight than their sometimes innocuous references to fallen avenues might suggest to readers today. I want now to shift gear and cross the ocean uh, and describe Cooper's role in American abolitionist contexts to show the transatlantic scope of his influence. Although critics used to assume that references to Cooper in abolitionist texts by African Americans must have been added on by their more literate white editors, this rather patronising view has given way to a recognition that Cooper's anti-slavery poems were likely known to black readers and writers through being widely circulated in the abolitionist press and in poetry anthologies. And even if they were not literate, um, African Americans likely encountered Cooper through singing hymns, uh, because we know that Cooper's hymns were sung in white and black churches. Important mediating sources for Cooper's works included various collections of anti-slavery poems published in Britain and America, and abolitionist newspapers, the best known of which is probably William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, and then also Frederick Douglass's North Star. Even a cursory skim through The Liberator finds a wealth of quotation from and allusion to Cooper, as well as intriguing items of information, such as the fact that the New England Anti-Slavery Society held its meetings in the Cooper Committee Room in Boston. Much of the content of The Liberator came from other newspapers, including British abolitionist ones, so the lines between British and American news and opinion become blurred. Accounts of meetings in Old England and New England alike are peppered with quotations from Cooper. Speeches delivered in London by the celebrated British abolitionist George Thompson are reported in The Liberator, and Thompson himself recalls being shaped as an errand boy and a Sunday school scholar by the desire to help the oppressed Negro, uh, and he recalls wandering the streets of London, repeating himself the lines of Cooper from the Negro's complaint, forced from home and all its pleasures, Afric's coast I left forlorn. With the exception perhaps of Frederick Douglass, uh, and there he is, who's been an established American classic for years, the genre of the African-American slave narrative was neglected for much of the 20th century, but is now attracting considerable attention. Perhaps most famously, in recent years, the narrative of Solomon Northrup has been made into an Oscar-winning movie directed by the British director Steve McQueen. The recent digitization of North American slave narratives by the project called Documenting the American South at the University of North Carolina uh, is a wonderful resource, and many such works are also being published in scholarly editions as well as simply online. Um, and we find that Cooper is quoted in interesting and complex ways in many of these works. Some of the writers cite the only hymns in ways that suggest a long-standing familiarity reaching back into their enslaved lives. Not surprisingly, God Moves in a Mysterious Way is the most popular, used not only to console, but also to empower. For instance, the life of John Thompson, a fugitive slave, quotes from God Moves in a Mysterious Way to comment on the sudden death and destruction which strike his evil slave owner. Cooper's anti-slavery poems are a hugely popular source of title page epigrams and other allusions within slave narratives. Harriet Jacobs, whose Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl from 1861 has been described as the most important antebellum slave woman's narrative available today, titles the chapter describing her seven years of hiding in an attic three feet high, The Loophole of Retreat. And this is a, a beautiful but rather grim allusion to a famous passage in the task in which Cooper describes his freely chosen seclusion from the world. The aforementioned Solomon Northrop's Twelve Years a Slave opens with 14 lines from the task on the dangerous use of custom to justify slavery. Uh, and the passage from Charity that we looked at at the beginning of the talk that denounces slavery is quoted by many writers to stress how slavery corrupts the enslavers as well as harms the enslaved. Um, and the attack on slavery from Book two of the task is often quoted to reach out to a kindred white reader whose soul, like Cooper's, is sick at the spectacle of slavery. Not surprisingly, several slave narratives whose protagonists escape to England also use the slaves cannot breathe in England sequence from the task. One of the most celebrated slave narratives, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, 
or the escape of William and Ellen Craft from slavery uses this passage as a title page epigraph, for instance. The 1852 narrative of the life of James Watkins describes Watkins' escape and safe passage to Liverpool at the sight of which he's overwhelmed. I could not help shouting and leaping for joy and I sang a song of liberty. Some of the bystanders declared that a mad black man had just landed from an American ship. My joy was unbounded and I was able to fully adopt and appreciate the assertion of Cooper that slaves cannot breathe in England if their lungs receive our air. That moment they are free, they touch our country and their shackles fall. I could also add with perfect confidence, now I am free. By far the most widely quoted of Cooper's poems in these texts is, no surprise here, The Negro's Complaint. Uh, the powerful 1831 History of Mary Prince was authored by London-based Quaker friends of the escaped West Indian woman, uh, and it quotes from the poem on its title page. The dignified defiance of the poem's speaker makes it particularly quotable, while the later stanzas, particularly the one I've highlighted in red here, uh, which envisages apocalyptic retribution for the slave trade, offer a potent warning to the tyrants who willfully continue their practices. Some critics have complained about the poem's use of sentimental stereotyping, but the fact remains that it gives a voice to millions of the voiceless enslaved, and it was embraced gratefully in that role. Many slave narratives cite the lines, skins may differ, but affection dwells in white and black the same. And this simple assertion of racial equality is one of the most meaningful contributions that Cooper made to the anti-slavery movement. I always feel sad that Cooper wasn't able to see into the future and know what a powerful influence he was to have on the course of American history. It's amazing to think that the reclusive poet from Olney created ripples that led to the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's fascinating to speculate how Cooper might have lent his weight to the ongoing movements for racial justice in our own time. Music